You are all here because you are uh, increasingly appreciating soil health. So I just want to um, do some reiterating about why soil health is important, why the soil biota is important, and sort of set the philosophical stage about how we approach managing all these organisms that we cannot see and even still uh, you know, are developing the science to study. So uh, a healthy soil is a living soil, but inoculants, powders, individual organisms can be really expensive um, and difficult to use. So what realistically can we do to improve the biological functioning of the soil? I'm hearing myself like half a second later, but that's probably necessary. All right, so what we'll do is, is um, talk about how, what it means that a he healthy soil is a living soil. I'll talk a lot about managing the habitat, managing soil as habitat. Um, talk about inoculants and then testing. So a healthy soil is a living soil. Many of the functions of soil that we need for agriculture and for the entire ecosystem and really earth functioning is about soil microorganisms and mesoorganisms. So these organisms decay organic materials and cycle nutrients. We would not have available natural soil nutrients without the activity of microorganisms. They can cause plant diseases. They can also prevent plant diseases. So all of the uh, fungicides that we use, you know, they are for a certain sector of soil microorganisms. We can also use um, microbes to help, uh, help plants to resist or tolerate those disease organisms. There are many symbioses and, and also parasitisms with plants. So we're learning more and more about very intensive relationships between plants and microorganisms that, again, uh, not just aid in the functioning of plants, but are necessary for, uh, for uh, plant growth, including uh, nitrogen fixation, which we'll hear more about later from Dr. Friesen. Soil organisms are necessary to aggregate soil. So erosion remains a, 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 an issue for the Palouse and all agricultural areas in the world it's the microorganisms that are very uh, necessary for forming soil aggregates. So a little bit more about um, plant nutrients. Um, this is to represent a, a, a root growing through soil and reaching out to an area of high phosphorus, phosphorus being a, a macronutrient, whether it's there from uh, a, a natural um, release from the soil minerals or from a fertilizer source, plant roots do respond to areas of high nutrients. They can increase the density of the root growth. They can even grow more root hairs, which is where they actually take up the nutrients. So plants do respond to nutrients. They can release their own acids and phosphatases to increase the availability of those nutrients. Well, microorganisms, um, then aid in that process. So, let's see, there's, okay. So, so uh, plant roots can release their own enzymes and acids to increase that nutrient availability. And the rhizosphere biology amplifies that response. The rhizosphere, you'll hear that word a lot today, you've probably heard it before. Rhizo means root, sphere means the area around, or, um, so rhizosphere is the area right around the root. That's where a lot of this activity is happening, right at the root surface. So the microorganisms in that rhizosphere amplify the plant response. They can feed on sugars, um, amino acids, and sloughed cells that are coming off of the root, increase their population and activity, and they in turn release there we go, Re release even more of these phosphatases and enzymes. So because the plant root is growing and responding to a high, a high nutrient area, that 
um, increases the growth of microorganisms in that same area to help out in that nutrient release. Um, those micro, microorganisms, and here, um, you know, mushrooms are an example of, of uh, the, the fruiting body of certain fungi. Again, we don't see most of these microorganisms. Once in a while, we, we'll see a mushroom in the field. Um, that's just the, the fruiting body um, of certain fungi. But most of their activity and life and biomass is in the soil. Um, so those microorganisms contain available nutrients. They do compete for nutrients with plants, so microorganisms are taking up the same nutrients. Um, and in some cases, you can actually have too much tie-up of nitrogen, in particular, into um, fungi and bacteria. The good side of that is that um, those nutrients are rapidly cycled when they're in the, the biological state. So when they are in a, a microbe body, they're not going to be leached out, and they're not going to be volatilized. So while there can be some competition, um, there is also rapid turnover of those micro, microorganisms. Um, so, so in addition to microbes you know, helping to release nutrients, they also help keep those nutrients in an active state in the soil, help keep them in the soil. Um, again, we'll hear more about nitrogen fi fixation later today. Now, this is one of the absolutely key functions of, of microorganisms that have increased plant growth on the earth, and therefore animal growth and human growth on the earth. Um, of course, we are um, fixing a lot more nitrogen through um, industrial process now, but it remains um, a, a critical uh, piece of agroecosystem functioning. Legumes with the proper rhizobial bacteria can fix uh, 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year or even more. Um, and mo most of you know, so this is uh, the nodules that form on the roots of legumes, and the bacteria actually live inside of those nodules that are formed specifically by the plant just to house those microbes. And there are free-living nitrogen fixers in the soil, too. We don't hear much about those because they, um, there's not as many of them. They don't fix as much nitrogen. But um, many studies have shown they can fix 20 pounds of nitrogen per year or more. It's not nothing. Again, it, it, it can be a critical part of ecosystem functioning, and it's definitely worth um, recognizing and supporting that function. And mycorrhizae. So I think that mycorrhizae are really an underutilized, undermanaged piece of our, uh, of our soil system. Mycorrhizae, again, there's that myco um, root word, means, um, means root. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, rhizae means root, and myco means um, fungus. So mycorrhizae literally means fungus root. And this is a symbiosis that most land plants have uh, with certain fungi. And there are a couple of very different types of this relationship. There's an ectomycorrhizae type, where the fungus grows on the outside, wraps around the roots. And they also send hyphae out, reaching out into the soil, but you can uh, visibly see them wrapped around roots. And then the endomycorrhizae, where um, the, the fungus actually grows into the root cells. And this is um, almost always an extremely beneficial relationship for both of the organisms. These endomycorrhizal fungi actually are, they have to have the right uh, plant host. They're not known to live on their own. And um, so most of the uh, annual crops that we grow, they have these endomycorrhizae. And uh, they make a big difference. So 
Just in terms of soil functioning and soil health, we see increasingly that these mycorrhizal fungi, they're hyphae that are growing out into the soil. They bind together um, microaggregates into bigger aggregates. So they're holding the soil together. Some of you have heard of glomalin. That's a, a protein that's coming specifically from these mycorrhizal fungi that hold aggregates together. And <clears throat> these fungi also expand the effective rooting volume of plants. So if we look at just, just a root, this is my very um, detailed drawing of a root, uh, the, the little pink area around here is to represent the zone of the soil where that root can readily get nutrients from. It's not very big. Now, toward the end of each root, they send out root hairs, and those help a lot. Those are where much of the nutrient uptake happens, but it still is a, a pretty um, small area. Now, with a, a mycorrhizal root, you have fungi, fungal hyphae that are growing into the root and way, way, way out, yards out into the soil. And they, again, are releasing these phosphatases and enzymes and taking up water. So you have a dramatic expansion of the effective rooting volume and the nutrient extraction zone when you have these mycorrhizal fungi. So they make uh, a big difference. Um, they also help plants to resist pests and diseases. As I said, improve soil structure. Oops. Um, increase nutrient uptake and root biomass. Protect roots from lots of stresses. The um, plants have better um, drought tolerance because they're getting extra water through those fungi. And um, increase plant yields. And there's some really amazing, uh, cool things that are being found out about how these microorganisms can form multiple symbioses. <clears throat> so for instance, we know that plants take in uh, carbon dioxide to, um, uh, to, to build carbon structures. And some of that carbon, some of that sugar that they form through photosynthesis um, gets transported down into the roots those sugars feed the rhizobial bacteria we mentioned. That allows those rhizobia to bring in nitrogen gas and fix it for the plant. That nitrogen then goes all through the plant. So this is an example of what happens in legumes. But we also see that with a mycorrhizal fungus, they can actually connect multiple plants can have a hyphae going right from the root of one plant into the root of another one. And scientists have been able to track carbon dioxide going into one plant and actually helping to feed the uh, mycorrhizal fungus attached to another plant. And in turn, some of that nitrogen fixed in a legume root can be transferred over into a grass. So we see that not only like is this relationship really amazing, but and this relationship is amazing, but they're all working together. So nutrients can be transferred uh, through these relationships. Earthworms, of course, um, can be extremely beneficial to soil health. Um, earthworm casts, their poop is extremely nutrient rich. Um, they help to mix and aerate soil, bury residues, um, release nutrients, stimulate microbial activity, and just to help make channels for roots. Um, you know, when they're active, they can help break through, um, break through soil and make channels for roots. So soil organisms depend on a healthy soil, and a healthy soil depends on soil organisms. And we can start thinking about, well, if we're gonna manage these, we can think about these organisms as livestock. Uh, a topsoil with about 3% soil organic matter, which is high for some fields here, um, 
but, but um, reasonable for, for many areas. Um, contains about 3,000 pounds of organisms per acre. The vast majority of that is the microorganisms. So uh, in, in uh, many fields, you can't even find earthworms. <clears throat> so the vast majority of that is the microbes. And a richer soil with more organic matter is going to have more of these microorganisms. Likewise, a richer soil can produce more forage and support more livestock. It's on the same order of biomass, of the number of, uh, the, the mass of livestock that can be supported above ground is about what's happening below ground. So your biomass below ground is um, you know, similar to the, 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 the mass of of cattle and or sheep that you could support above ground. And what's happening below ground depends very much on the foods that, uh, the foods and habitat that are provided. So managing soil biology is very much about managing their habitat. So we'll talk a little bit more uh, uh, about uh, inoculation later. But when you start thinking about, well, should I inoculate? We know that these organisms are important. How do I get them there? Do I add them? Well, are they already there? Are they going to survive? And will they actually improve the outcome? So there are lots of questions about adding inoculants. The first is, are they even going to, uh, are, are, they, are they already there? So many um, healthy soils will already have these, these organisms. But if you do inoculate, are they going to survive? What we see a lot is there are, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of inoculants out there, right? Lots of things you can buy. And every one of these have worked in lab and or greenhouse studies, or they wouldn't be out on the market. Um, but are they actually going to do anything in the field? What we usually see with inoculants is that you can inoculant, inoculate the soil, and here's your population, and then they die out. You can inoculate again, and they, they die out. You can keep re-inoculating with a lot of these, these inoculants, and they just don't last if there's no habitat. Um, whereas, if we also are enhancing the habitat, they can start to hang on. And you can help by, by inoculating and you know, the, bump up the population, but they have to have something to hang on to in order for them to actually build up over time. Um, so you can build organisms up through inoculation if you have <clears throat> an, an open niche. So in terms of uh, actually enhancing the soil community, you can use inoculants to change certain populations. They're going to be short-lived without the right environment. <clears throat> and you can also use habitat enhancers, which I'll talk, uh, which I'll really focus on. So uh, spaceship lands tomorrow, and 20-foot tall lizard people step out. Are you prepared? I'm not worried about the lizard people because they don't have a niche here. This is relevant. <laughs> we need to think about niches. This is, this is an ter ecological term that means you have to have the right environment. You have to have the right habitat. Alien lizard people come from another planet. They didn't develop here. Do they have the right foods? Probably not. Do they have the right organisms that are required for the functioning of their guts? Probably not. Do they have good neighbors? You know, not if they land here. Um, it's not going to go well. So the, the landing of the lizard people is kind of like adding an inoculant into soil, all right? you are expecting that something that didn't develop there to just land and populate and take over and do their work. It's not likely. 
Um, so I'm just trying to, to emphasize that the niche, the environment, is really critical here. So good inoculants can be synergistic with good management and the right, in the right habitat, but they can't make up for poor habitat. Uh, meaning the, the better your soil health is, the less likely you are to need inoculants. So um, improving soil as a habitat then, first you want to minimize stresses. So just like plants, microorganisms are very sensitive to, to soil pH. The pHs that we're starting to see under, under about five is really critical. Um, even 5.5, you start to see a dramatic decline in uh, the functioning of nitrogen fixers. So minimizing stresses like pH, uh, some areas, especially down toward the Tri-Cities, we have electrical conductivity issues or high salinity. That also is going to reduce microbial functioning. <clears throat> And, gener <clears throat> sorry. Um, and generally, mo trying to moderate extremes in moisture, temperature, and other habitat factors. Now, we don't have control over a lot of that, but we, we do somewhat, and I, I will get to that. So organic matter is the key, and um, Dr. Huggins will later be talking about different kinds of carbon, different kinds of organic materials. So as a general rule, Build it and they will come. Build the soil, build the soil organic matter, and the microorganisms will, will arrive. And when they arrive, they'll be able to hang on. So that organic matter is food, is habitat, and is buffering. <clears throat> um, buffering of, of pH and moisture changes. Uh, and there are many sources of that organic matter. Generally speaking, or soil organic matter builds up in, in soil where you have moderate to cool temperatures, moderate rainfall, uh, fine textured soils, so high clay content areas, fine roots, which again, you'll, you'll hear about from Dr. Madsen later. Um, I'm just prepping you all for all the other great talks coming today. Um, and at a depositional area, meaning bottoms of slopes, that's where you'll, you'll tend to build up organic matter. So more organic matter additions, including your crop residues and things like manures, um, uh, uh, moderating and re reducing decomposition rates, um, especially by uh, reducing tillage, and your soil organic matter can build up. Um, these are principles from the NRCS, extremely solid advice about um, uh, managing the soil health. Principles are to disturb the soil less, diversify the soil biota by diversifying plants, keep a living root growing throughout the year, and keep the soil covered as much as possible. In terms of managing soil health and the soil biota that is critical to that soil health, these are really wise principles. So, you know, many of the, the practices and materials that we depend on, these all affect soil biota. The tillage, fertilization, um, crop rotation, fallows, <clears throat> herbicides and fumigation, uh, they all change the system that these organisms are trying to live, live in. So, um, how do we improve soil, soil health? Um, like the statement that there's no silver bullet, but there's silver buckshot. There are many methods that can help to improve soil health. And again, you'll, you'll hear much more about um, specifics later on today. But I like to think about it as uh, first do no harm. So we, we know that uh, practicing conservation agriculture, like increasing crop diversity, um, keeping the soil covered through residues and where possible cover crops um, and reducing tillage and traffic help to conserve the soil. So first conserve and then build. Many ways that you can add organic materials to the soil through um, biomass, especially roots, um, materials you can purchase or get from uh, uh, from neighboring farms sometimes, including uh, compost, manures, 
So if you add high carbon materials, you are going to build up organic matter, um, more likely <laughs> build up organic matter. Um, in addition to the carbon, all those other nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, are also needed to build up soil organic matter. So making sure that none of those uh, nutrients get, get down into the critical low zone, um, that's important not only for your plants, but for maintaining soil organic matter. Um, and, and diversifying plants helps to diversify the food sources for microbes. Um, so in terms of conservation, you know, um, it, it's, uh, uh, methods are well established to um, reduce, um, uh, reduce equipment passes using bubble tires and track equipment. Um, and there's more and more work, of course, on cover crops, including these incredible tillage radishes, um, uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, radishes that um, uh, build very, very deep and wide roots can break through compacted zones. So in addition to minimizing the building of compaction, there are more and more methods to actually break this compaction up. I know that some, some people in, in the area are, are working with these tillage radishes. So again, just um, both uh, conserving and starting to build up. All right, <clears throat> again, Dr. Madsen will, will uh, speak in particular about living roots later, and I wanted to reemphasize that it's because this rhizosphere zone is where it's happening. Uh, so this is a drawing of, of the rhizosphere, including the root itself, but you know the, the root is not just one discrete physical structure. The root is continually exuding chemicals. It's exuding sugars, amino acids, foods for microorganisms, this stuff called mucigel. Um, it creates a moist, rich habitat for microorganisms. Um, so if we want to improve these beneficial microorganisms, we've got to create that habitat which includes overall improved soil health, and in particular, those living roots, because there's so much nutrient and good habitat right around the root. So there is, um, there is a place for inoculants. But I wanna talk about um, who and when. All right, if we look at um, the, the activity of microorganisms in the soil um, over time. So this is um, looking at a timeline of a year, starting with January, and we're looking uh, on the uh, y-axis here of overall bacterial and fungal activity. <clears throat> so in January, there's not much going on, right? It's really cold out there. We don't wanna be out there either. Um, as temperatures in the soil start to warm up, microbial activity and biomass start to increase. Um, early summer is in most areas where we have the most activity of soil microorganisms. Uh, plant growth is ramping up. We've got lots of exudates coming out. Temperatures are increasing. All the nutrients that have been released through um, free, freeze, uh, freezing cycles uh, are available for organisms. So we have a, a real ramp up in activity and biomass. Into late summer, we start getting um, nutrient depletion. Things start drying out. We have another little bump often in the, at the first frost because again, that freeze-thaw um, cycle in soil helps to re release some nutrients, um, and then declining it again into winter. So, um, you know, interesting to know overall, but in terms of, of thinking about when to inoculate organisms. So there are several things going on. 
Um, we want to inoculate, it, so many of the most important inoculants are these symbiotic organisms. They're the rhizobia for nitrogen fixation, the mycorrhizae that associate with almost all of these crops except canola. Um, so you want to inoculate those symbionts when they have the right plant in place, right? Doesn't do a lot of good to inoculate those organisms in the fall when they're probably just going to freeze out and, and die. Um, it can also be, though, a bit more difficult to inoculate a new organism into a soil when all of the, all of the other organisms in the community are already very active, right? So just like, um, uh, yeah, a, 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 a colonizer, maybe even the, the lizard people landing, there's already organisms in place, then you would have to bump other organisms out of the way in order to get established. So in the uh, early spring, around planting time, is a good time to inoculate, both because the plant hosts are uh, ramping up in growth and because the intact community isn't very active yet. There's not gonna be as much competition. Okay, in terms of um, overall, what we see as, as useful inoculants, this is the, the order of priority. Get your rhizobia and brady rhizobia in place. Then think about mycorrhizal fungi, then PGPRs, there's a whole range of plant growth promoting rhizobacteria out there. And then biocontrol agents, um, there's a lot of potential there, but also tend to be um, th some of the harder to establish. So rhizobia, again, um, Dr. Friesen will talk more about later, but these are for nitrogen fixation and they are plant host specific. Meaning if you're growing alfalfa, there really are only just, just a couple of species that associate with alfalfa. If you have Rhizobium melilodi, but you're growing chickpeas, you will not get nodules, you will not get end fixation. You have to have the right species of inoculant for each group of legumes, okay? Now, if you've grown, um, if you've grown and had good nodulation on that same legume within the past five years, you're very likely to have those microorganisms in place. But if you haven't grown a specific legume for a few years or ever, get inoculant and get the right one. Um, and there are uh, granulars and powders and, and liquids. So, you know, follow the, the directions, but get the right species. Even if you have nodules, I will say that all rhizobia are not created equal. And again, I know Dr. Friesen will, will talk much more about rhizobia. But um, I've talked to some, uh, some producers of, of rhizobial inoculants. There's not a lot of testing on the actual amount of nitrogen that's fixed by those inoculant organisms. They want you to see nodules and know that things are inoculated well. That doesn't mean that you can't get more in fixation by using a different brand or subspecies. So even within each species, uh, even within Rhizobium melilodi, there are, there are hundreds of different strains within that. And they, some of them are better in fixers than others. So um, first, First priority is to make sure that you are getting nodules, um, and you know they're not always huge, but um, at least uh, you know ch chickpeas make nice, nice big nodules. Alfalfa nodules tend to be um, only the size of a, a, a large, large pinhead, but um, it is worth trying out some different brands of inoculants also again, with, within the right, the right species. So you can increase, uh, potentially increase in fixation. So in this picture, all of these, these were lentils, um, all of these lentils are inoculated. They all, or they all have 
uh, nodules, but these nodulated organisms are performing a whole lot better. They're fixing a whole lot more nitrogen. So um, uh, you, you, you can get more in fixation and just optimize that relationship um, with some different strains of rhizobia. Is there any conflict if you put two different ones together? Is there conflict? There, there can definitely be competition. Yeah, so again, just because you inoculate a new one doesn't mean it's going to establish well, but the, the time of opportunity is, is best in the, uh, uh, in the early spring to get that, get that new, uh, new strain established. And you really, you, you, you can't know uh, without, without doing some on-farm testing, which I'll, I will get to. So there is lots of opportunity, I think, in improving uh, and fixation inoculants. There are lots of other, oh, I didn't get to mycorrhizae. So um, mycorrhizae are kind of in here also. Um, there are mycorrhizal inoculants out there. Again, I encourage you to, to give them a try. I'll talk a little bit about testing at the end. There are lots of other kinds of these PGPRs, plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. You can buy phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, um, Sidirophore producers to grab hold of um, iron and other micronutrients, free living end fixers, hormone producers, lots of things to try. Hay infusion, I think, is a really interesting one that we're actually working on in, in my lab. You can brew up, um, brew up um, high populations of protozoans just in a warm solution of some hay or straw. Um, they seem to like a chunk of potato in there, and wait, uh, wait seven to ten days, and you'll have a perfusion of protozoans. And studies are showing that adding these protozoans um, does increase the um, the rate of of uh, residue decomposition as well. Increases the rate of nutrient release, so it can help in nutrient release in the in the spring for instance, or in the late summer when it's starting to deplete. There are lots of interesting things out there. Lots of different brands of things that you can buy or biodynamic preparations that you can make. Um, so just as an example, this is one brand and a bunch of the um, genera uh, of organisms that are in that, that mixture. These are all organisms that you can find in soil, though. All right, so a healthy soil with lots of organic matter very likely has all of the organisms that you're going to buy in mixtures of, in mixed inoculants. Um, and uh, so this is just some advertising information from one of these materials called SC27, and it's very honest and I think very true. Results have shown that SC27 may increase crop growth, increase root mass, increase yield, and improve crop quality. Please note, crop responses will be different in different situations. Crop production is based on managing a diverse set of inputs, yada, yada, yada. Results may vary. Again, I think that every one of these products that are on the market, they can be useful some places and sometimes. And they are out there because they've, they've been shown to work in the lab and or greenhouse. But um, it doesn't mean that they're going to work for you. And it doesn't mean that they're going to be um, economical. So a lot of these materials are not really independently tested. They're not necessarily tested in the field or locally. Uh, sometimes these materials um, don't have good controls. Um, meaning they'll use their product plus a lot of other fertilizers compared to um, an area that has no fertilizers and not their product, and then compare the two. It's not really a fair comparison. So be suspicious of, of uh, just the, the, the results that a company is showing you. Products often contain micronutrients, which is not a bad thing. That's a good thing, too. We have a lot of fields that are 
lacking in micronutrients. I know that zinc is, is um, coming to a lot of people's attention here. Um, but many times you'll be getting a plant response from the micronutrients, not from the organism that's also in the inoculant. Okay, so not a bad thing, just, just saying that you're not necessarily getting the response from the organism if you are getting a response from the product overall. Um, the benefits of these um, inoculants can, are highly variable and can be temporary. Again, if the environment's not right, those organisms are not gonna establish. And just because e even if you do get an increased yield, it doesn't necessarily mean increased profit. So when you're trying out a new material, keep track of your expenses and not just the product itself, but what is it taking you to actually put that material out there and how often are you gonna to need to do that compared to what are you really getting as a benefit? So, um, I, I, I can't, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Um, all right, so what I'm getting at is habitat is really important. Inoculants can be useful, but uh, I can't tell you which ones are gonna be most useful. And so this is where I highly encourage the further development of this farmer's network and on-farm testing. There are some producers who, who are doing small-scale on-farm testing. You are all capable of doing this. So some, some principles of actually trying, these, trying things out. Replicate. That means, and I've seen many times where, and, and not just in farming, but in people's lives, you know, you wanna try something new and you go all in. Well, you can't necessarily tell, you know, the next year whether you're seeing effects from that product or from the weather or from something else that you did the year before. So, um, uh, replication means having several areas where you have side-by-side -side comparisons where you apply a new material or method and you don't. Apply and don't. So replicate in, in space and then try it again the next year. Replicate in time. Decide what you can monitor. What is it that you really want? How are you going to tell if something's working? Decide beforehand what you want to change, and whether you can tell if it is changing. So, um, if possible, even the year before you try something, establish those measures. What is your yield? What is your soil carbon? You know, am I getting nodules? Um, decide what you can monitor and stick with that, and take notes, too, because you don't always know what uh, the, the benefits of a product are going to be. So again, this is just a really simple um, layout of a paired replicated test and both practically and statistically, this is really powerful. So um, again, identify multiple separate areas. And this is exactly what you know, researchers do when, when we try to set up something. Identify several spots, several areas, where you can pick one side or the other, and you want to randomize whether it's you know, not always on the right-hand side, sometimes it's on the left-hand side, but treat and don't treat, treat and don't treat, treat and don't treat, don't treat and treat, All right? That means you've got pairs side by side, yes and no, and in your don't treat area, you want that to be your normal management. So what are you already doing that you know works pretty well? And then add in um, the, the, the new material or, or management. And then replication, so several places. Um, and I mentioned, so I uh, think beforehand about what it is that you wanna monitor, but also just go out often and look around. Um, there can be additional benefits or indications of change that you didn't think about earlier. And sometimes you can tell, like, are things greening up, 
Are things greening up faster? Um, you know, does this area, does your treated area suddenly, is, it, is this area covered with aphids and this one not? Or the opposite? Um, so you can um, observe changes that you didn't expect to. So with that, um, I will <laughs> just end with, soil organisms uh, do not constitute the life of the soil. They're the organ organs of a living organism. So we are managers of our fields and of this earth. And good inoculants can be synergistic with good management, but can't make up for poor habitat. I believe we have a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Right, yeah. Um, so, yeah, intercropping is, is a great example, or in, you know, in, in natural systems where we have um, plant diversity um, side by side. Um, right, so spa spatial relationship is very important. Rhizobia do not move very far, you know, less than a centimeter. Um, Mycorrhizal fungi can expand several feet, even a couple of meters in the soil. But yes, uh, intercropping is a, a great way to get those, those uh, relationships. So th things like um, pea oat mix, where you've got a legume and a non-legume, uh, there we, we often see these synergistic relationships. Um, uh, I know that there's also work with um, things like peola, so peas and canola. Um, I didn't mention much, but these, these mycorrhizae, um, and actually um, Jeremy will we'll talk more about canola, and I don't wanna uh, spill, spill his whole story, but it is known that can canola is not a mycorrhizal fungal host. So when you grow canola, you don't have those mycorrhizae active, and during that time, um, those fungi, you know, they have to hang out with nothing to eat or do for a whole year. So something like peola, where you have an intercrop of a host and a non-host, that means that you are very likely to maintain those beneficial organisms in an intercrop, where, whereas you likely would not, or they'd, you know, have a much harder time in just canola. So yeah, I, I think generally, like, this is a little bit off, but I'm really excited about the winter peas coming out. Um, I think winter peas are gonna be uh, just a huge change, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for intercropping with peas. So helping to provide nitrogen fixation and uh, their, their um, good mycorrhizal hosts also. So I think they'll help out in that way.